Okay, good afternoon. One of the things as I minister to pro-life activists around the world that I often say to them is that um, abortion destroys itself. No lie can live forever, and this was something that was said in the civil rights movement. The truth can be suppressed for a while, but eventually it comes out of its own force. So you can close up the window, it'll come through the door, bar the door, it'll go through the roof, but one way or another, it'll come out. And one of the areas, of course, in which, uh, and one of the reasons for which the other side has run out of arguments is that in a day of ultrasound and fetal therapy and fetal surgery and admissions in medical textbooks that the unborn child is our newest patient, it's impossible for supporters of abortion to say that this is simply not a child or not a human life. It's clear, clearer than ever before to the naked eye that this is exactly uh, the person that we're dealing with. And I mention this, first of all, because I want to show you a resource which is uh, very, very uh, powerful and available to you for your work now and in the future. Uh, and secondly, because it says something to us about the theme we've been dealing with, and namely the intersection between the battle against abortion and our work in the church of proclaiming the gospel and, and uh, putting forth the teachings of the church. Because at the heart of not only our teaching, but our spirituality, and really it's at the heart of Lenten spirituality, when we, when we think about the season that we're in right now, is the purification of the mind and heart so that we can better see the truth. This past Sunday we had the... the, the uh, a reading of the, the man born blind, and that was, was his sight, was to see, in fact, who Jesus was. He had an open heart to see. When he was asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? He said, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? As opposed to the Pharisees who were rejecting all the evidence that was put in front of them, trying to deny it every way possible, and still not accepting it in the end. The value of that open heart, ready to see what God wanted to show him. We have, when you look at Catholic spirituality overall, a spirituality based on truth and based on the fact that we have to constantly train ourselves and allow the grace of God to transform us in such a way that we can face the truth head on. And that we especially, who are uh, commissioned to, to teach the Word, have the grace and the strength to proclaim the truth in all its rigor and vigor and its totality to the people that we're called to serve. Well, obviously, that, that, that pertains so well to this particular topic because, as, uh, as I was saying to some of you earlier, the last thing that abortion supporters want to discuss is abortion the last thing they want to talk about. They want to talk about rights and freedom and women's health and constitutional rights and on and on, all the kinds of slogans and abstract concepts. What do they not want to talk about? Well, they don't want to talk about, for example, the words of Dr. Warren Hearn, who uh, says that uh, when the uh, Abortionist does the procedure, quote, the sensations of dismemberment flow through the forceps like an electric current. Or as he describes in his, in his book, Abortion Practice, medical, key medical textbook on abortion, uh, describing, that the, uh, uh, it's describing exactly how to pull the arms and legs off the child in a, uh, in a second trimester abortion. Or for that matter, the words of Martin Haskell, uh, in um, under oath, in court testimony, describing legal, not illegal, activity, um, and talking about how, indeed, in the uh, performance of, um, of of these abortion procedures, the uh, dismemberment is done 
And then uh, the last thing remaining inside the uterus is the child's head. And he says it's floating around like a ping pong ball. And the abortionist ultimately has to capture it and make a, a nick in the head and uh, bring out the head in fragments rather than as a unified piece. Now, all of this kind of disturbing language is, again, found not in church documents. It's found in medical textbooks about the procedure, legal procedure. It's found in court testimonies by practicing abortionists carrying out these procedures. I say this because when you and I ask the question, how are we going to get out of this mess? How are we going to move from a nation that is destroying close to 4,000 children every day and has abortion still legal through all nine months of pregnancy to a nation where each and every one of these children is protected? We have to expose the evil. We just heard it again in this last Sunday's readings, in the second reading. Paul says to the Ephesians in, in, verse, in chapter 5, verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather expose them. Think about it for a moment. If abortion destroys itself, if the truth can never be hidden, and if, in fact, we're made according to the truth, the law is written in our hearts, and so although our perception of that truth is obscured by original sin, Nevertheless, grace is always available to help us perceive it again. Well, then, exposing the reality of abortion, whether by words or by images, exposing simply the reality of who the child is, is going to help a lot of people. We don't have to jump right away to those instances where even those who see these things or hear these things will not be converted. Because when you talk about getting to the ultimate goal, of a nation that actually protects these children, the fact of the matter is you don't have to convert everybody. You don't have to convert the hard-hearted person who ultimately is going to look at all the evidence and still not be convinced. So be it. We'll go after them in a pastoral way. We'll try to reach them through spiritual conversion. But we can also reach them in a nation where all the children are protected because the ones who are open enough to see that evidence and be changed by it have gotten the evidence. This is one of the tools, and, and you know, we sometimes tend to think, well, you know, everybody knows that this is, a, this is a child. Well, in one sense they do, and in another sense they don't, because there's knowing and knowing. There's knowing at different levels. And uh, most people have never seen these kinds of images, and I'll tell you how we got them, and how you can use them. But here we have, for example, look at that. This is, this is a technique of embryoscopy. You're going to see the child at only six weeks and six days. See the, the beating heart there. These images are obtained through embryoscopy, a camera placed right up against the amniotic sac. Look at that, amazing. Now, ultrasound is powerful, and we know the effect it has in changing women's minds about having an abortion. This is far beyond ultrasound. This is, uh, again, direct video imaging of the unborn child. The disadvantage is it's not a process that is used very frequently. But the footage here, which is in a uh, video called The Biology of Prenatal Development, is footage that back in the early years of my work with Priests for Life, a, uh, a fellow pro-life leader and I discovered a uh, a medical article in which a doctor in Florida said that he had done embryoscopy procedures and he had this footage sitting in his closet. He wasn't doing anything with it. So we contacted him and said, would you be willing to let us use this footage for a, a video project? He didn't want the footage to be used in a video that was saying anything against abortion, but he was willing to let it be used in a video that was simply saying things about the unborn child and the development of the child. So it went through various versions of production and a team of embryologists and other, other uh, experts in, in fetology were brought together and worked on not only the uh, video 
uh, footage, but also worked on uh, the commentary that goes with it. And they established a, uh, a body of the latest medical commentary on every part of the body at every moment of development in the womb, ending up with a video that was so technically uh, uh, good that National Geographic put their stamp of approval on it. And it's called the Biology of Prenatal Development. Now, what we did was establish a foundation called the Endowment for Human Development. EHD.org is the website. The strategy here was simple. Instead of taking this footage and right away announcing to churches and pro-life groups that now we have a new pro-life video, we went first to the doctors and the scientists and said, would you get behind this project and make it medically, scientifically unassailable? Because had we started off under the banner of pro-life, Planned Parenthood would have trotted out their medical experts and raised all kinds of questions as to the reliability of this particular footage and the commentary surrounding it. Instead, now, having gotten such a team together to make something that even National Geographic put its name on, Planned Parenthood can't do a thing about it. Because now they would look foolish if they brought out experts to try to assail this. It's unassailable from a medical and research point of view, and therefore now we've reached the point where we can start having churches and pro-life groups point to the scientific resource and use this. Fact of the matter is, when many people see these kinds of images, they come to a brand new appreciation of uh, who the unborn child really is. Now, some people will say, well, isn't it enough to you know, show people who the unborn child is? No, not all the time, because what we're trying to convey is a twofold reality. Who is the child? And then the question of what does abortion do to the child? The showing images of the live child does, still doesn't answer that second question. And if people think that abortion somehow, well, they have a general understanding, abortion ends the pregnancy, of course, so does birth. That's what people, when people say, well, you know, what is, what, I love to say to abortion supporters, especially at the clinics, well, what is an abortion? What is it that you're here to defend? Oh, well, it's a termination of pregnancy. I'd say, well, so is birth. The question is, how does it terminate the pregnancy? You know, imagine uh, you know, a man convicted of killing his wife saying to the judge, well, Your Honor, I'm not guilty of murder. I just terminated our marriage. You know, yeah, you terminated your marriage, but the question is, how? What did you do? And this is the thing, again, as I say, that abortion supporters, it's the last thing they want to discuss. One of the things we provide, and you'll see it on our website, um, in fact, there is a, um, a special domain that we set up called unborn.info. Let me just turn to that real quickly here and show you what I'm talking about. Unborn.info has on it an explanation of what we just saw, all right, the EHD embryoscopy footage, and it begins playing here uh, to let people see this incredible footage. Um, but then we also have at unborn.info an, an, a very large amount of material that talks about the procedure itself and that diagrams the uh, medical facts of the, uh, of the abortion procedure. So let me see um, uh, where we have it. We have diagrams here. Uh, here, for example, D&E abortion descriptions and diagrams, and you have something like this, again, which most people, again, when they hear the word abortion, do not have any connection to the reality of the steps in the procedure, as you see here, the, the D&E procedure, the most common um, second trimester procedure, and it's done even into the third trimester, is the actual dismemberment of of the child piece by piece. When we even have many people in, in, uh, in America who identify themselves as pro-choice, they are opposed to overturning Roe v. Wade. They would not associate in any way with the pro-life movement. But if you showed them this diagram and said, do you think this kind of activity uh, should be permitted under the law, they would say no. Right? Mind you, they consider themselves pro-choice, but they would say no. And in fact, many of them would say, how can we or what can we do 
to stop this kind of activity. It's offensive to them. One of the key things we need to do as a church and as a pro-life movement is simply to bring people back to the basics and show the American people what an abortion is. One of the things I say uh, most frequently is America will not reject abortion until America sees abortion. And of course, we, one of the, the ways we need to train ourselves here and draw strength from each other is the uncomfortable uh, position that we're in when we convey uncomfortable truths. But certainly, the truth about abortion is not going to be the only thing in which our ministry requires us to convey uncomfortable truths. Okay, so those are some of the resources. We make these diagrams available. We make these uh, videos available. And um, uh, those yellow, in, in fact, this might be, uh, Justin, if we can get those yellow cards on the back, this might be a good time to give those out because anything I'm talking about this afternoon if you want a specific resource, like if you want this embryoscopy video, we, we don't have copies with us here today, but I'll be happy to send them to you. You can request that. You can uh, request uh, specific things. Yes, let's, let's just hand them out. You can request other specific things that I might make reference to, or you can also put a question or a comment on the card if we don't have time to get to your questions during the, uh, during the session today. Uh, we also, as I say, have these diagrams. We did a, we did a project I was telling some of you about uh, in Congress. We brought our team of priests, and we brought Dr. Alveda King. Now, as you may know, she serves on our staff full time. She's the niece of Martin Luther King, Jr., and she proclaims that the civil rights movement of today is the pro-life movement. So we brought her into the halls of Congress, and you should have seen, and we went to the, the most pro-abortion members of the House and the Senate that we could find, the, the worst ones of all. We went into their offices, and, um, and uh, you know, I, I, we let Alveda lead the way. And she'd go in there. We went into one, one pro-abortion senator's office from New Jersey, a young guy at the, at the uh, reception desk. You know, we bring in Alveda, and we say, oh, this is Dr. Alveda King, the niece of Martin Luther King Jr. He jumps out of his seat. Oh, my goodness, what an honor. Oh, this is great. Mrs. King, I can't believe I'm meeting you. What a great way to start my day. And Father Peter West on our team was standing next to her and he says, well, I hope you're as happy as after we tell you what we've come here to tell you, uh, and, uh, which was, of course, this. And our question to the legislative aides of these various senators was one question only, and a very simple one. When you say the word abortion, is this what you mean? We're not asking them about any legislation. We're not asking them to make it illegal. We're not even asking them if they think it's right or wrong. We're asking them, when you say the word, is this what you mean by it? You should have seen the responses. Squirming and not wanting to look at it, looking away, wincing. Oh, uh, uh, we, we never saw these things before. Nobody ever asked us this question before. We don't know. And I said to the legislative aides, I said to, I said to them, you mean to tell me you're the chief uh, assistant to the, your senator you know, on the matter of abortion, and you don't even know what he means by the word? I mean, that's when you think about it. That's, that's a pretty stupid position to be in. You don't even know what he means by the word. How are you supposed to assist him in dealing with this issue? But they don't. Many of them don't know what they mean by the word. And they don't want to know, and it's the last thing they want to discuss. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that this is a key road to uh, resolving this, this particular problem. Okay, um, let me um, also build on something I was saying before about the many connections. We, we, we spoke briefly about the many connections between the abortion issue and our pro-life response and the Eucharist. Let's look at some of the other key areas that we deal with in, in our faith and worship and draw some connections there as well. For example, the season of Lent. You tell me, if you're going to stand in front of a congregation and give a pro-life homily in Lent, what are the key connections between the great themes of the Lenten season and pro-life and our opposition to abortion? What would some of them be? 
Good. Exactly. The key Lenten theme of repentance, of a hardened heart being softened by God, and of the urgency of doing that. Of what do we need to repent? We need to repent of the hardness of heart that allows us to kill our children, of the hardness of heart that allows us to even tolerate the killing of, of children. Because remember, it's not just saying to people, don't kill your children. One of the key things we do as a church is to say to people, it's not enough not to kill your child. God is asking you for a response when the other person is killing her child. What's your, what, and, and remember, isn't this the line that we have to help people cross? Between saying, I would not be involved in abortion, and saying, on the other hand, I have something to say about whether someone else is involved with it. Because what most people say is, well, oh, I would never have one myself, but if somebody else wants to do it, that's what? That's none of my business. And that's where we come in, to help them draw the connection between saying, well, wait a second. How, if that's none of my business, okay, how is it any of my business if that person abuses their child? And I ask in, in my pro-life homilies, I ask, well, you ever hear somebody say, if you're against child abuse, don't abuse your child, but let the rest of us have our own choice? Violent crime, well, if you don't believe in it, don't commit one. But if someone else wants to commit one, well, it's not none of your business. What's being missed there? What's being missed is that the choice as a victim. And that's one of the reasons for using the kind of resources that I've shown you here briefly is the more that we help our people think in terms of, wait a second, we're talking about a real person, our brother, our sister. Well, the, the practicing Catholic to whom we're ministering already has a sense of thinking that, okay, there's a rationale why even if we don't know their names or have never seen their faces, we intervene to help the poor, the victims of earthquakes and tsunamis, uh, those dying of AIDS, drug abuse, war-torn parts of the world. Who are these people? I don't know who they are. But on the other hand, I do because they're my brothers and sisters. So of course I have an obligation to them. Well, they're not putting in the category of brothers and sisters the child in the womb. So yes, this is, and this could all be, without everything I've just been saying, can all be built off of, well, don't harden your hearts to your youngest brothers and sisters. Let's repent of our indifference. So key theme of Lent, the repentance. What other connections with Lent? Yes. Okay, so the key Lenten theme of the cross, the cross coming to the just, to the righteous. And this is, of course, something that a lot of people fear, and hence they won't get involved in this kind of, uh, of activism. What else is a key Lenten theme? What is Lent preparing people for? What, what, what is a, a key sacramental theme of Lent? Baptism. The catechumens will be baptized, and the rest of us will do what at Easter? We will renew the vows of our baptism. Okay. What's the connection between that and the fight against abortion? We had the right of election recently, right? What's election? Choice. Who chose? God. You did not choose me. I chose you, says the Lord. Now, why does the Christian community welcome the elect? Because they chose them or because God did? You see the, the connection? What the whole theology of baptism is, really, is a theology of choice. It's a theology of welcome. It's a theology of inclusion and community. Think it through this way. God makes the choice first. He makes the choice to call people to life and life eternal. He makes the choice to incorporate them into his body, and therefore, in making the choice, he's asking the rest of the Christian community to welcome that person, not based on their judgment about any criterion whatsoever, but based on the prior election of God. Therefore, whether it's a baby or an adult, the Christian community welcomes this life with joy, acknowledging that God has done what? 
he has entrusted us to the care of one another. If baptism is welcome, then abortion is exactly the opposite. Abortion is exactly the non-welcome of the life that we judge to be too burdensome to welcome. And it is the, based on the idea that we have responsibility to others only when we choose to have such responsibility. Whereas what the whole theology of baptism tells us is we have responsibility for others, both on a supernatural and a natural level, before we choose. The responsibility comes first because God's choice comes before ours. And then, of course, ultimately, Lent is preparing us to celebrate the Paschal Mystery. The Paschal Mystery by which what happens? The entire kingdom of death is conquered. We're preparing to celebrate the greatest event of salvation history precisely because that greatest event turns the kingdom of death upside down, robs death of its power. Life is victorious. It's easy to preach about pro-life in Easter because it's the whole season of life. But Lent, too, is preparing to celebrate that. And so we understand that to stand with Christ, and we'll renew the, the vow to do that when we renew our baptismal vows at Easter Mass, the choice to stand with Christ is a choice to stand with life and to stand against whatever destroys life. The uh, empty promises. Do you reject Satan and all his works, and all his empty promises. What's one of those empty promises? One of those empty promises is pro-choice. One of the empty promises is that abortion is somehow going to solve the problems of an individual, a family, or a nation. It's an empty promise. And the Christian is vigorously choosing to reject that empty promise. So the connections go on and on. Lent, we can talk about the other seasons, we can talk about the other sacraments, we can talk about the other doctrines, we can talk about the Holy Spirit, uh, advocate. If he's the advocate, when he fills us, what does he make us? Advocates for the weak, the defenseless. He advocates for us in the heights of heaven. We can't save ourselves. If we can't save ourselves and we acknowledge the Lord saves us, what are we supposed to do for fellow human beings who can't save themselves? Advocate for them. It flows, all of it flows from the heart of what we believe. I want to take more questions. Let me just point out this booklet inside of your black uh, folders makes a lot of these links for you and begins the thinking process by which you can establish links like this in your teaching and preaching and in writing. Uh, biblical passages, liturgical seasons, sacraments, etc. Um, it'll it ties it together for you. Because what we're showing here is, again, for people that when we preach about abortion in the parishes, we're not asking them to adopt some kind of political ideology. This is why a lot of people feel like, oh, it's not, a, you know, quote, unquote, appropriate to talk about this in church. Well, but if our ultimate commitment here flows from the very things that church is dealing with, sacraments and seasons and doctrines, well, then, of course, it's not only appropriate, it's already contained in those things, and it's our privilege and responsibility to draw that out for people. So you'll see more ways to do that in this booklet. Let me pause there, and let's take your questions and comments. Yes, I think uh, if we use this mic, then we'll be able to get it on the uh, recording as well. Yeah. Father, uh, thank you for being here. I was just going to uh, comment uh, with that Lenten theme. Yes. Um, the divine ransom on the cross. Jesus purchases a chance at eternal life for all of us with his death on the cross as that ransom. So that points to a theme we hear about in the parishes all the time, which is stewardship. Yes. And I think it would be interesting in a homily potentially about pro-life just to talk about stewardship and how we're stewards of our bodies. Yes. Not owners of our bodies that God, with the same goes with the unborn child, that we're simply stewards. Exactly. Parents don't own the child. Exactly. So that beautiful, beautiful connection with a theme that people hear a lot about. And you might want to also use the example of uh, Dr. James McMahon. He was a, now deceased, he was a, a late-term abortionist in Southern California. And he was asked 
you know, you do these late-term abortions. Isn't it clear to you that this is a child? And you know his response was? He said, well, of course it is. But to me, there's a more important question, and that is, who owns the child? It's got to be the mother. Who owns the child? First of all, I thought we got rid of slavery in this country. And secondly, when we look at it from the point of view of belief and faith, it's only God who owns us. You are not your own, Paul tells the Corinthians. He, pro-life king. It, yeah, in fact, if you have questions, you might as well, you can just line up at the mic, and then we can do it that way. Yes. Thank you, Father. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're in a parish as a priest, and the nearest abortion mill, a uh, very explicit sort of pro-abortion um, expression is, you know, two, three, four hours away, um, I have all intentions of driving the three hours, monthly, um, you know, quarterly, whatever. But in terms of, um, for those of us who aren't in areas where abortion mills are right down the street, uh, in terms of like a spirituality of reparation or theology of reparation, how do we instill that in the people that even though it's not in our face, you know, for those of us who don't want CNN every day or reading the papers from the, the, the more rural areas, yeah. How do we instill that in our people that you have this duty too, as a Christian, as a Catholic, to really defend life? Yes. And you can do that by, you know, acts of reparation and really instilling in them this duty of atoning and, um, you know, for those of us, for those that are ignorant or don't, we can because we do see the truth and we yeah. want to live the truth. Yeah. It's, uh, first of all, the... Um Tying it in with themes like, okay, well, you know, we may not have an earthquake in our, in our community either, but, you know, the world is smaller and smaller every day. Uh, obviously, these are our brothers and sisters who are in danger or in need. But also tying it to the fact that even if there's not an abortion facility anywhere near that community, the people in that community can still and will go to where there is one and get one. So... It's the ministry to them, the ministry to the people right here in our midst who might be tempted to travel as far as they need to in order to, to, uh, to, to, to have that uh, procedure. The sense, too, this sense can be heightened through testimony. I'm going to talk um, later this afternoon about the Silent No More awareness campaign that many of you are familiar with and how you can utilize that as well. But it is the question of if you can connect with those in the congregation who have been through this and have either made the choice for life when they may have easily gone the other way or did have an abortion and now have repented of it, to share that testimony makes it real for the people in a way that simply talking about it doesn't. And, and that's a way to keep it real for them and to say, hey, this is in our midst. This pain is in our midst. This temptation is in our midst. Don't think of it as something far away. Thank you, Father. You spoke uh, about using images to help uh, the pro-life cause and to show what abortion is. However, some in our pro-life movement will use very graphic images, maybe at the pro-life march or at abortion clinics, to show what abortion is. And I, I was just wondering, is there, do you see that has any place in the pro-life movement? And if so, uh, when is it practically good to use and when is it not? Yes. Well, most people, when they wrestle with this question, are going to come down on, on the last point you made, that there are appropriate uses of such images. Um, it would be hard to, to really maintain that they have no value whatsoever because the question here is not whether we like to use them or prefer to use them or even if we just think it's right to use them. The question is, are there principles of social reform that have been uh, demonstrated in other movements where deeply entrenched social evils were, were opposed and change was effected, and the, uh, are there principles that show us uh, the way to get there? And we do have that, uh, whether it's in the civil rights movement, anti-slavery movement, um, women's rights movement, ch uh, child labor uh, 100 years ago, uh, protecting children from adverse conditions and abusive conditions in factories and mines. In all these different movements for social change, 
you see a pattern, among others, of visualizing the victim. And, and visualizing the victim helps people to both identify with the victim and to see the problem more clearly. Um, Alvita and I talk about this all the time when her dad, who was Martin Luther King's brother, uh, and Martin strategized with the other leaders of the civil rights movement, they wanted to make sure that segregation became visible to people. When Emmett Till, the young teenage boy, was brutally murdered, his mother said, I want an open casket because I want people to see what they did to my boy. That's the face of the evil we're fighting. That's the face of segregation. And when the pr uh, prayerful, peaceful protesters came out of their churches and started walking in, uh, in Birmingham, the water hoses were turned on them with a force strong enough to strip the bark off the trees, and the dogs were unleashed against them, and the cameras caught the abuse and began to awaken the conscience of America that segregation was really something bad. It wasn't just a concept. Well, after that, then Martin and, and his brother were very aware of this, when the demonstrations happened and the people were about to be attacked by the segregationists, guess who they attacked first? The cameramen. They would, they would take black paint and put it over the lenses of the cameras before they started attacking the civil rights activists because they didn't want the violence to be exposed. There's, and, and, and there's a lot on our website about this, on that unborn.info. We have galleries of these pictures of the aborted babies, but we also have a historical uh, analysis, and you could do a theological analysis too, of, you know, what, what, what should we be doing in this regard? Uh, now, you could, you could ask, does it work? It certainly works. I mean, I've, I've been holding images myself like this in front of abortion mills and have had cars stop dead in their tracks on the way there to get the procedure because, they, because it breaks the denial. They say, I don't want to do that to my baby. Um, when and how can they be used? They, 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 they should always be in a peaceful context. While we don't deliberately target or concentrate these efforts in areas where there are a lot of children who gather, uh, nevertheless, uh, you can't avoid, it's, it's like the double effect, you can't avoid, if you're going to get this message to the general public, uh, you can't avoid the fact that children are going to see it. On the other hand, we have uh, child psychiatrists on our medical advisory team who, 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 who tell us very clearly, the images themselves are not going to traumatize the children. It's the reaction of the parents that is pivotal in how they're going to be affected by uh, those images. So anyway, that's in a nutshell. One of the best ways to show this, this, this uh, information is online, where you give people the clear choice of you want to look at this or you don't. But at the same time, you challenge them. You say, well, look, if you can't bear to look at it, well, then how can you, how can you defend it actually taking place, uh, which is a good, a good argument to use even when they don't want to look at the images. Yes. A little bit political, and maybe you, uh, you're going to cover it in your next section. I talked to you about it. Yes. Uh, about 20 years ago or so, uh, there was a clergy for life uh, in dinner or lunch, and uh, Senator John Danforth was then the speaker who was a Republican and leader in Congress. And right, right. He kind of shocked the group by saying, you're not going to change the laws of this country, uh, at least Roe versus Wade. Put your efforts more into changing hearts and, and whatever. A corollary of that, uh, since then, that I'm sure been disputed maybe, but a corollary of that today would be, I believe this uh, candidate I'm going to vote for, even though it's pro-choice, is, is more pro-life because he or she is is going to vote for releasing uh, millions of dollars of funds, and every day there's and the figures are st staggering. How many children die of malnutrition and all these things, and you know not not the right health care disease. Right. right. Uh, and then a a third little aspect is the the controversy over the bishops' guidelines for political in the last uh, election, where there was some the next you know, hoping the bishops will give them tighter guidelines, and some hoping whatever. Yes. Um, you know, it's amazing. I, I use this analogy. It's amazing these kind, of, these kind of assertions that are made by some people, as you said. I said, look, suppose a candidate come forward and said, 
I believe in terrorism. I think the terrorists have a right to do what they do. They want to do it. It's their right. Do you, are there any voters that are going to stand up and say, well, sir, I uh, disagree with you on terrorism, but what's your health care plan? No, I'm going to vote for this person because, oh, they're doing a lot of good things. Terrorism, it's just one issue. The fact of the matter is that there are some positions that a, 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 a one who seeks or holds public office can take that so contradict the very meaning of public office and the purpose of government that they are disqualifying issues. Now, nobody's saying that they're the only issues. We're saying they're disqualifying issues. Why? And this is pertinent to the, uh, to the, uh, to the third part of your question because they destroy the heart and soul of all the other issues. It's one thing to say, well, you know, abortion is the, is the fundamental issue because it is taking the most lives, and that's true. No natural disaster, no disease, no crime, not poverty, not war, not AIDS, not drug abuse, nothing's taking more life than abortion. Uh, so when they start to talk about this in terms of numbers, well then, if they're going to use a numbers analogy, abortion is the number one problem. But it's, it's, it's not just that it's more important because of that. It's that if we don't get it right regarding the fundamental right to life, we cannot be right on the other issues. What do I mean? Well, because if you stand up and say, I, I'm going to defend the right to education and housing and health care and protection from terrorism and so forth, you're not acknowledging those as human rights if you're not acknowledging the, the right to life because a human right means it belongs to you by virtue of the fact that you're human, not because somebody granted it to you. So obviously if you can kill children in the womb, the only way you can justify that and the way they do justify it is that someone didn't grant it to them. Not because they're not human. The abortionists themselves admit that these are human beings and the evidence, as we've already seen, cannot be denied anymore. So they're not denying that they're human. Neither did Roe v. Wade, by the way. Roe v. Wade did not say, we've come to the conclusion that the unborn are not human and therefore they don't have to be protected. Roe v. Wade said, we're not in a position to judge if they're human, but we're going to remove protection from them anyway. Well, hold on a second. You just changed the nature of government. You change the nature of government because now you've abandoned the principle that government exists to protect the rights of the people. Now you're saying it grants those rights or it can take them away. So when we deny, or when a government, when a policy denies the fundamental right to life, it's taken away the basis for fighting for all our other rights as human rights. And if you take away the basis that these rights belong to you because you're human, then you weaken the foundation and you, and you assert, intrinsically you assert, that you can also take those rights away in the future if you so desire. You can't take those rights away. Um, but you've already started, you've already introduced the principle that you can in, uh, in Roe v. Wade. Now as far as uh, the, the first comment, you know, uh, well, you know, it's, uh, hearts and minds have to change uh, uh, before the laws do. Well. But that pertains to every issue. Uh, and so, so, I mean, you can't, you can't, I mean, obviously, changed hearts and minds are going to lead to changed laws and policies. Because when someone's heart and mind is changed, they're going to go work for justice in society. Fact of the matter is, a lot of people's hearts and minds are changed. So we have to get those whose hearts and minds are in the right place to start electing the right candidates and lobbying for the right laws. We can't just say, oh, well, we're going to wait for everybody's heart and mind to change, and then we'll get around to the business of running the country and political responsibility. No, political responsibility is our responsibility now, even while a lot of hearts and minds aren't changed. And the other dimension of it is this. Think of the effect that decisions like Roe v. Wade and laws either in favor of or against abortion have on the hearts and minds of the people. Of course, we need to change hearts and minds. We have to also have to change laws and policies. Because when laws and policies are going in the wrong direction, what impact does it have on a grade school student 
to know that the Supreme Court has legalized abortion. That's shaping his heart and mind to say, oh, this must be okay. So obviously it's a mutual causality and it's a mutual responsibility that we must do both at the same time. Don't let people put you into a position where um, you've got to, you feel like you have to choose either or. All right, uh, it's time for our break. We'll take these questions as soon as we come back. And um, you've got the yellow card you can fill out and leave with me if you like. More materials on the table. And uh, we'll resume in 15 minutes. Thank you for your attention.